Before we get started, we wanted to let you know that hours after we recorded this podcast, the safe harbor deadline related to the Paycheck Protection Program was extended from May 7th and is now available through May 14th. So we just wanted to make that information clear as we do mention the Paycheck Protection Program and Safe Harbor during this episode. Now, please enjoy. Let's get surety. You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hi, everyone. This is Kat Shamapande. Thanks for joining us for Let's Get Surety. Today, we're going to be talking about the COVID stimulus law and paycheck, paycheck protection program and really taking a look at a CPA's perspective around that. So as our guest today, uh, we have Julian Xavier. He's a managing principal with CLA. Hey, Julian, thanks for joining me. Hey, Kat, how are you doing? Glad, glad to be here. Nice to chat with you. Well, I am sure that you are getting a lot of questions around the PPP and forgiveness yep. of those PPP loans. I know we're getting them, so I'm sure you are too. Yeah, no no doubt. We're spending, been, I, tell you how, I don't, can't tell you how many phone calls a day that I'm having and others within our firm are having with our clients our contractors around, hey, we've, we've gotten our PPP loan, which is great. We've got funding. And now the, the fun begins, you know, how do we track it and how does forgiveness work and what is, you know, how's this all going to work? And so, yeah, we're, we're spending a tremendous amount of time just, just talking to people about, hey, what are the steps and what's going on? Yeah, so if we take a look at what, what is loan forgiveness based on? I feel like that's probably a good place to start with the PPP. Yeah. Or is there- yeah. So, yeah. Maybe let's go kind of high level cat. And sure, yeah. like you said, so, you know, I think, which is great news. A lot of folks have gotten, you know, they've gotten uh, approval or maybe they've gotten funding on their PPP loan. And so that's, you know, that's step one. So they had to submit an application and it was, you know, high level based on their average payroll costs. Um, from the, from uh, from last year, and they get they got a loan for two and a half times that average uh, that average payroll cost. So that that's the great news, and a lot of a lot of our contractors have been able to secure uh, loans. And then really the, the big question, and, and I'll be perfectly honest, the the guidance still is not crystal clear on the forgiveness. But but high level on the forgiveness piece, what happens is you you get you got your your loan and you get funded. And then it's, the clock starts ticking. So once you get that money and it goes into your bank account, um, the clock starts ticking. And so what happens then after the money comes in, there's an eight-week period after the loan gets funded where you know contractors have to look at and say, okay, how are we spending the money? And, and really what needs to happen is you have to track the how you spend the money in, in high level. You have to spend uh, of that loan. So let's just say, you know, somebody gets a loan for a million dollars. So, you know, the next eight week period, uh, 75% of that million dollars needs to be spent on payroll costs. And then an additional 25%, no, no more, on uh, non payroll costs. And that includes uh, paying for utilities, kind of keep the lights on, the energy, the you know, so that's utilities, also for rent agreements, and then to the extent there was any uh, interest on existing debt, you know, so you can spend 25%, and so if you spend 250000 in theory, that's how you, you, would, you would then get um, all of that million-dollar loan uh, forgiven, right? So that's pretty high level. It's the eight-week period, 75% spent on payroll, 25% on these other non-payroll costs. And that's kind of step one. And if you meet that condition, uh, that's step one. And you're, at that point, the, the analysis would be that, yes, you can now um, have that entire loan forgiven. Okay. So if we were to look at the 75% that you said has to be spent in the eight weeks on payroll... Uh-huh. What mm-hmm. what's really covered under that? Yeah, no, that's, what, that's, what's not covered? Maybe. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great question. So, so payroll costs. 
And this is where it's, it's been, you know, that's where there's been, you know, questions as to, you know, what are, you know, what are payroll costs, right? So payroll costs, you know, this is where you've got to track. So you've got costs, you're paying, you know, salary, salaries and wages. And again, you have to limit that. Uh, for anybody that, that makes over a hundred thousand dollars, there's a calculation. So you've got to re reduce that down. And the maximum amount for anybody over a hundred thousand in that eight week period period is, is uh, it ends up being fifteen thousand three hundred and eighty five dollars. Uh, but then on top of that, there are other costs that that are part of the of the payroll costs, and so that would be things such as uh, local. Uh, state and local uh, payroll taxes. You've also got uh, retirement uh, benefits to the extent you, you you have you know a 401k plan that can come in, and also employer paid uh, health insurance costs also are part of that payroll cost. Okay. So you know, and then and I'll be honest, we've had questions. People are saying, "Well, what about things?" You know, and there, there's some very good questions on payroll costs. What about like workers' comp insurance? And currently, the way it stands, workers' comp insurance is not is not deemed an allowable uh, payroll cost for purposes of this this calculation. What about Social Security and Medicare? Are those included? No. So the federal components um, are not included and are not part of the the payroll cost components. So I have another question too. What if you have yeah. employees who are paid um, on a commission basis, so or have bonuses that you would be typically giving given out at a certain time of year, maybe this time of year? How would that be included in this? Yeah, yeah. So you, if you got commissions and you have you have bonuses, as long as those are here, and here's kind of the the, the kind of the the catch, or I guess. You, you have to look at what was incurred and paid, you know, during this uh, during this eight week period. So that's and this is where there, you know, people are still we're trying to get a little bit of clarification because it talks about incurred and paid. But under your question, if you had uh, commissions and those were incurred and paid uh, during that uh, eight week period, you know, that would be fine. And a similar uh, along the similar lines, you know, bonuses that were incurred and paid, you know, during that uh, eight week period, those would also be allowable uh, as far as payroll costs. Okay. Um, and are the payroll costs on a net or, a, or, or are they on a gross basis? So, so yeah, it's a good question. So you're, so again, this would be on a gross basis when you start looking at your, on your wages and salaries. You know, those are going to be on a, uh, on a gross basis. Again, the only limitation being, you've got to limit that. Anybody that makes over a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars, they, there's some, some limits. You have to scale that uh, down. Uh, for anybody over a hundred thousand dollars, yeah, was, and that's interesting. So you can't use any funds for anyone from the pay, PPP for someone who makes over a hundred thousand dollars. Is that right? Well, no. Well, you you can, but you just have to uh, get so for that eight week period. In other words, you have to reduce. If somebody was making, let's say, extreme, somebody's making, um, you know, a million dollars. You can only limit, you can still claim dollars paid to that person, but you have to you reduce that down and say, so for a hundred, you know, to limit that to a hundred thousand dollars and the way the calculation comes out, that's, it ends up being $15,385 for that eight week period. Okay. And for someone making over a hundred thousand, you're still able to possibly make a cut to their salary. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you'd still pay them. You know, I think you'd still continue to pay them whatever their, you know, whatever their salary is. But again, just for purposes of this calculation for allowable payroll costs, you know, for this eight-week period, you just, you just have to limit that 
uh, and, and reduce it. But you know, you'd still you could still pay them whatever their normal salary is, but just for purposes of this calculation, there would be a limitation. That makes sense. Uh, does the do the guidelines offer any restrictions around how much salaries can be cut for an individual or can't be cut? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so uh, earlier I the beginning I said, you know, if you you spend like a million dollars and you 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 spend seventy five percent on allowable payroll costs and then you know twenty five percent on the interest, um, you know, rent and utilities. That's fine, but then there's a couple other tasks that get pretty complicated, but I'll go pretty high level. You, the other things is there's a there's a measurement on your the number of full time equivalent employees uh, during this eight week period, and to the extent you if you reduce the number of full time equivalent employees uh, compared to a prior, the prior period, uh, then that could reduce your loan forgiveness. And then the other point that could uh, reduce loan forgiveness, and you brought that up, is if you cut the the pay uh, for somebody more than 25%, right? So that's if you if you were to reduce the, the, the pay of an employee by more than 25%, and then you also have a reduction in your uh, average full-time equivalents, that is going to uh, reduce that potential loan forgiveness. In my example, that million dollars. So if you had a reduction in full-time equivalents and you reduce the pay of an individual employee by more than 25%, that is going to eat into that loan forgiveness. And that, that calculation gets pretty complicated. So I, you know, in the time we have, I probably won't be able to get into all the detail, but there right. is... There's really three things. So it's you got to spend the money during the eight weeks. So you got to spend all the money, 75, 25. You got to look at your full time equivalents. And there's a there's a there's a calculation there. If you maintain at least the same number of full time equivalents, you know, you, you're still good. You, you potentially would have the full loan forgiven. And then you look to say, did we reduce the, the pay for anybody more than 25 percent? If you didn't do that, then technically you would be able to have all of this loan uh, forgiven, which is okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, that's what everyone wants, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's Uh, what everybody wants. Yeah, yeah. that's what we're talking a lot lot about with people is now, like, how do I make sure I'm spending and and tracking this, you know, to make sure I do get 100% of the loan forgiven? Well, and it sounds like tracking is the key here. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. That's that's and that's a great that's a great point. So that the the tracking is key because the other thing I'll I'll, I'll say the other point to this there's been guidance that's come out and where it currently sits is that for any loan amount over two million dollars there there was guidance that came out that said, said any loan over two million dollars is going to be subject to audit um, by the SBA. So that's, you know, so that becomes not, not to say that if your loan's less than 2 million, you still don't need to properly, you know, document and track. But if you're over 2 million, the, the guidance that come out as come out as says you will be audited uh, if your loan is over 2 million. So, yeah, so that's where, you know, you need to have, uh, you know, really a good process to to document how you're how you're spending these these funds in you know that eight week period after after you've gotten your loan fund loan funded right and without that information you know you're going to find yourself in a pretty difficult situation this is yeah. something that you know everyone should be tracking now and not waiting to try and make up towards the end of the eight weeks right. Yeah, yeah, it should be like what we say, like it's contemporaneous. So you know, have that 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 flow uh, currently. And so there are just some 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 thoughts there. You know, there's there's some, and it's not required, but one one idea that we we've seen 
is, you know, you know, opening a new bank account. So when you have, you know, your loan, your PPP loan come in, you open up a, a, a brand new bank account and you call, you know, PPP loan fund. And so in my example, if you have a million dollars, it goes into that separate bank account. And then what you can do then is you track. And so when you're paying payroll, you can, you know, move money out of that, you know, this new bank account to fund the payroll. Uh, if you're paying, let's say, you know, rent or you're paying utilities, you can identify those and use the funds out of the separate bank account. And so you kind of develop a nice trail of, okay, we have the money come in and then you very clearly document where did the money go? You know, okay, funded payroll, great. We have a nice, you know, nice documentation there. Okay, you paid rent for these eight weeks. Okay, we see that. Utilities, interest. And so you just want to make sure you're properly capturing and, and documenting, okay, where did that money go? How did we spend it? And so that's that's going to be critical to, to keep track of that currently as you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so we've kind of talked about that 70% and how it has, to, 75% rather, and how it has yeah. to be spent. What about the, the 25% that's used on non-payroll costs? Yeah. Are, are there restrictions on what that can cover? Yeah, so it's pretty, really, it's, and this is, you know, where, you know, again, we're looking for, you know, some, some additional guidance clarification, but really what, what they, uh, the, the guidance, what the law says right now that, that the 25% can be used for uh, mortgage interest, interest payments. So if you had existing, um, you know, mortgage, real property, loans that were in place when you have your funding you can cover so the interest payments rent and so rent's an interesting one you know most companies they have you know rent on their building and a lot of contractors also have lease agreements and so we're looking to get you know 100 percent clarification but you know what it looks like it's gonna the this rent would also include uh, payments on, you know, equipment leases in addition to office, you know, leases. As long as those lease agreements were in place at the time, you know, of the, of the loan funding. So you've got, you've got interest payments, you've got rent, and then you've also got uh, utility payments. And so the utilities would be things like, you know, telephone, you've got your electricity, and, you know, whether, you know, could be your gas bill. So it's basically, you know, utility cost in, in essence, keep, keep the doors open, keep the lights on to, to yeah. keep the business going. So it makes make sense to yeah. kind of have that kind of keep, keep the business open, keep the doors open. Yeah. Well, those are two of the components. I know, I think another thing that plays into this is full, um, full time or full employment. Yeah. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that was kind of the earlier I had mentioned this concept of full-time equivalence. Yeah. And so really the, the thought is the part of this is to look at you know, the, the loan forgiveness calculations. You, you do have to look at, you know, the number, uh, the average full-time equivalence in this eight-week period, and you have to compare that to, there's two really two prior periods you have to compare to. And again, you, the goal here is you need to maintain at least uh, an equal number of full-time equivalents to not have your loan forgiveness reduced. So they are looking at, you know, full-time, I think that's what you're talking about, like full-time employment, full-time equivalents. And so you're, you're, you know, you're, you can't reduce your headcount in essence is what it's saying. Don't reduce your headcount, you know, during this eight week period. And if you don't do that, if you maintain your headcount, then you should be in pretty good shape from a, you know, loan forgiveness. So it's it's comparing it to where you were historically. Is that right? Yeah, it's comparing it to where you were at uh, historically, and they do give you. It's it's kind of it's kind of a it's it, this area gets a little tricky, but you you compare your full time equivalent uh, during that eight week period, and you go back. And it's kind of an interesting, you can go back to either February 
uh, 19 through June of 19, or you can go to January 20 through February 29th, 2020. So you you kind of look at those two and you have to, you know, you do the calculation and you have the option to choose either one of those uh, prior periods to do the analysis. But yeah, it's basically going back and looking at history. Okay, what was our employee headcount in a prior period when things were, you know, in theory, you know, running smooth and, you know, before all this madness hit. And then you look at that in the eight week and you, you're, you're supposed to maintain you know, at least a comparable headcount to, uh, to not have your loan forgiveness reduced. Okay. I, I was wondering too about the loan forgiveness. Uh, do we have any guidance around the application process for the forgiveness? Yeah, that, that's I and mean, that's one thing that's that we're we're still trying to get ironed out. So, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, you, you get through the eight weeks. Everybody's first step. Everybody's trying to make sure they understand how to track everything over the eight weeks. And then, yeah, at the end of that eight week period, you know, contractors, companies are going to put together a package, basically saying, you know, here's. Here's my analysis. Here's how I spent the dollars. Here's my full-time equivalent headcount. You know, we didn't reduce anybody's pay by more than 25%. And so you're going to submit a, you know, a, a loan forgiveness application. And that's where it's unclear, you know, how long or how that, you know, how quickly or, you know, how soon that, uh, that application will actually get approved. And then yeah. right now they're saying anybody who's, you know, that's over $2 million, that's going to be subject to audit. And so the question is, you know, how long, you know, how long is it going to take to get around to auditing? And so that's, yeah. that's really the challenge because folks, you know, from a reporting perspective for, you know, contractors financial statement, that, that becomes a question, right? So initially you get the loan. And so you record it, and it's a loan. So you, you you have the money in the bank, and then you record, in my example, a million dollars. So you have a loan on your on your balance sheet. It's a liability. And so you get through the end of the eight weeks, and let's say you do your calculation, and you know, the contractor thinks, okay, it looks like I, I've met all the conditions, and it looks like my loan will be forgiven. But they still have to leave that million dollars as a loan until they get formal uh, approval of the loan forgiveness. So that's the part we're trying to figure out, you know, how long is that going to take? What's that going to look like? But I'll be honest, that guidance is still not uh, super clear on yeah. how that's all going to work. But you can't, you have to leave it as a loan until you do get formal notification that the you know the loan all of the loan or a portion of the loan you know has been forgiven so that kind of addresses how it'll be looked at on your balance sheets uh-huh yeah. yeah balance sheet is going to be a loan so you're going to have a liability until until you get that formal uh loan forgiveness and then then what will happen there is you know my example was a million dollars and so if the, you know, you do get full forgiveness, that million dollars instead of a liability will end up, basically it'll end up as income on the, on the income statement. So we, we take it off, it's no longer a loan, and now it's gonna be other income on the contractor's income statement. So that's gonna be, you know, additional, you know, profit, so to speak, that'll go to the bottom line. But again, that can only be done once there's this official forgiveness notification. Right. What if you were in a circumstance where you were, your, your forgiveness application was denied? Have they given any guidance if that can be appealed or is there an appeal process in place? Yeah. You know, I, uh, I have not seen anything on that. I think part of it is the, the, the larger loans are going to be subject to audit. And so that's where, you know, the over $2 million, you know, I think part of that is they're going to audit your application, right? So they're going to okay. audit it. And I envision there'll be a final audit where the audit will say, yep, we're, we're, you know, we agree, you know, you do, you know, you're entitled to whatever that loan forgiveness is. And so I think that audit mechanism 
is going to be, you're going to need to have that kind of that audit. And then that will be, I think, whatever the results of that audit are, I, I, I guess you could appeal or if you dispute it. But I think ultimately, whatever the resolution of that audit, that will drive forgiveness. You know, the, the loans under the under $2 million, yeah, I'm not, you know, if they're not going to audit those, there's probably going to be a very, you know, it's not going to be as detailed of a review. And so the, that process might might go a lot a lot quicker and it might be a lot smoother but that that's a good question i if, if it does get denied there, there 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 has to be some mechanism to to appeal but again that's that has not really been you know clarified. that's not clear yet yeah not, not clear yet yeah um so i had heard that the irs had announced that companies who do receive these loans wouldn't qualify for tax deductions of payroll is that Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to touch on that. So, yeah, when this originally came out, what was uh, it sounded almost too good to be true. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, so it said, you know, if your loan got forgiven, uh, you would get, as I mentioned, so on your income statement, you'd get, in, you know, let's say a million dollars of income. The loan was forgiven. And the IRS did, they did say, they came out initially and they said, you know, that loan forgiveness is not taxable. So that was good. So you're going to get, yeah. okay, I get a million dollars of income and I don't have to pay any tax on it. And so everybody was thinking like, this is the greatest thing ever. Then you're right. The IRS came out and they basically said that in the, any of the expenses that you incur, and when I, t- I talked about that eight week period, so you're tracking yeah. costs in that eight week period and to the extent you have costs that uh, you're using for your loan forgiveness, those costs are not deductible for tax purposes. So so you get the million dollars of income, but you don't get to deduct any of those expenses that went into that, you know, to getting that loan forgiven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That really helps clarify that a little bit. So I know not as good an answer as people were originally thinking because, you know, it was like, wow, this is great. I'm going to get the income, no tax. But anyway, no, the, the, exactly. the expenses are now, it's come out that those are not deductible. But I, I've been reading, you know, people are appealing and trying to see if the IRS will change their position. But as of now, you know, those expenses are, are non, non-deductible. Well, I know it's like all of this, um, some of the, guidance has changed as, as you know, the program has moved along and now we've gotten the additional funds in the program um, that Congress put through, you know, yeah. there's some reluctance and maybe uh, people thinking they took the loan when maybe they don't want to have taken the loan. Um, yeah. And there is safe Harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a, that is another area and a topic that has been, one, I'll be honest, that we've spent quite a bit of time on. And you're right. So a couple of things have come out. There's been some guidance and some clarification that's come out around the orig- the initial loan application. And, okay, did, did your company really need the, you know, need the funds, right? Because, you know, a lot of people, I think, jumped on board when this originally came out. And said, okay, yeah. we got less than 500 employees. Everybody's like, yeah, let's apply and let's, let's, yeah, let's, you know, let's take advantage of this. And now there, there's been a push that says, okay, uh, you need to make sure that you really, you know, had a need. And you're right, there's a safe harbor and the clock's ticking. Um, you have up to May 7th. <laughs> so today's May 5th, uh, May 7th <laughs> to return. Uh, any any of the uh, you know if you have a PPP loan and you don't feel that you know you you really had you know a need then you can return those funds by May seventh. Okay. Okay. And and so that's been there's been a lot of you know again it's not clear. Matt, this is the problem. They 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 said well you know when you you know how do you quantify do you have you know did you have a need when you you know, when you applied for the loan. And so there's, you know, what we're advising folks to do, you know, can't, can't, in every circumstances is different, every situation. 
it's kind of, you know, when you looked at everything, you looked at, you know, your, 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 you know, just your customers that you're working with, the, what you're forecasting with the, the downturn in work, the economy, just you, you document kind of what your thought process was when you applied for the loan, you know, why you thought, you know, you would need this loan to kind of continue your operations and keep your company, you know, financially stable. And you really just need to make sure you properly document, you know, your, your, your thought process, you know, when you did that. And, and so it's, again, this is the area that's confusing. And there's been, there's been a lot of push by organizations asking to get an extension on this May 7th date, the safe Harbor. Yeah. But we haven't, nothing's come out. We haven't seen anything yet. Uh, as to getting some extension and, and hope and clarification on that topic. Yeah, it sounds like it, there is more clarification needed. Well, oh, absolutely. Uh, when you're, do you have any key points or tips you'd want to give out to anyone who's who's gotten these PPP loans? It sounds like number one is documentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the tips, you know, first off, you know, documentation. It is tracking the the, the expenses uh, over the over this eight week period, and for most people, they're just the funding is just happening. You know, some folks haven't even been funded yet, and they might have been approved. So, track and, and document. You know, uh, currently, so don't don't wait till the end of the the eight weeks and try and go back. So you want to have a good trail. Document. You know your your payroll costs your these these other 25 percent costs make sure you have a good trail you know track and document and then you know the other tip would just be look look at your you know employee headcount you know there's there's some guidance do your full-time equivalent calculations for those two prior periods and then kind of look at your full-time equivalent headcount that you have you know in this eight-week period and try and manage that because there are some strategies. You know, if you did lay off some people and you hire them back by June 30th, you know, you can include them in the full-time equivalent calculation. So I'd say get get a handle on your FTE count. Make sure you understand that so that, you know, you, um, you, know, you understand what potentially could happen on your loan forgiveness. But you don't want to wait to the end and say like, oh, shoot, my full-time equivalents are – or down, yeah. and then that's the impact. You want to be on top of that. Look at that. Make sure you understand that. And if you need to rehire anybody, you know, do that. And so that you're, you know, you're really on top of your FTE calculations and, and where that, you know, where that sits. Sounds like it's a good time to talk to your CPA. <laughs> yeah, and that's the other thing. Reach out. I would say, <laughs> you know, reach out to your CPA. You know, and most firms like CLA, we've got, we have, you know, tons of resources and we've got people that are experts on this and other, and other firms as well. And, and yeah, I'd say reach out because it is complicated. It's confusing. The calculations are not straightforward. So, you know, reach out to your CPA, you know, potentially reach out, you know, maybe even your bank, uh, but reach out for help and, and, and guidance. Make sure you're looking at things the proper way. That the costs you're trying to claim, you know, make sense. That those are the right costs. That you're doing your, you know, your FTE calculations properly. But yeah, consult. That's a great point. Consult with your, you know, your CPA, and and get some advice on 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 how this all works. Well, I know, like as you mentioned, that Clifton Larson Allen or CLA has been putting out a lot of information around this. Um, where can people go to find that information? Yeah, so that's, yeah, I'd say for us, the best place would be to go to our, you know, to go to our website. And actually, let's see here. And we have a resource, um, a landing spot related for COVID-19. So, you know, so you just go to you know, www.claconnect.com forward slash COVID-19. And there's, we've got a, a ton of information, resources, articles uh, on all of this and great, great resources for people if they, you know, are unsure on something that we have a great, great spot they could go to. 
That's terrific. Thanks so much, Julian, for sharing with us today. It's so much yeah. to sort through. It's great to have have you here to kind of sort through it with us. Oh, my, my pleasure, Kathy. It's, it's definitely not straightforward and, you know, happy to, you know, hopefully shed, shed a little bit of light on, on the, this complicated topic. Thanks, Julian. All right. Thanks, Kat. Have a great day. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org.